So good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to uh, have to see you all back here in this uh, Tensor Network uh, colloquium. So today we have the great pleasure to welcome Luca Agliacozzo from the University of Barcelona, who will uh, tell us about insights from universality on Tensor Network simulations at an out of equilibrium. So please, uh, Luca, the stage to yours. Thank you, Frank, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present um, this uh, idea and results here. Um, this has been work in progress for uh, now several years. Uh, and so I'll try to give you an overview of all the various things uh, that are somehow connected. Um, one sec. Why does it work? Let me try this. Okay. So this is the outline. I will first uh, review somehow the equilibrium uh, many body problem and uh, discuss very briefly long tangle state and tensor network states. And then I will go to out of equilibrium where we will all uh, kind of review the fact that uh, possibly uh, quenches are a good uh, scenario for the out of equilibrium dynamics. And there is a big uh, problem in complexity. Uh, I will give a uh, a specific uh, explanation of where this arises from in a certain class of system. And then I will take from there uh, and, and try to uh, get inspiration again from equilibrium on how we could try to address these, uh, these uh, complexity in quenches. I will give some um, RG inspired explanation and I will start discussing about the quest of universality out of equilibrium. Okay, so. Uh, at equilibrium, these are, have been uh, the main three characters that helped me along the journey. Obviously, there have, there have been several other uh, uh, collaborators in this, in, this, in this journey, but I wanted to acknowledge mostly the three of them. Uh, Sofiane Glisdier here from Barcelona, La Torre also from Barcelona, and Philippe from, uh, from Amsterdam. Um, so let, let's start with the, with the main body problem. And the idea, as we all know, is that when we have several constituents that live even in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, the state of the, of, of the system lives in the uh, tensor product Hilbert space of the states of the constituent. And hence, uh, the tensor of coefficient that describes the state contains exponentially many parameters. Uh, and this exponentially many parameters, we all know that means that uh, if even the simplest case in which the constituent have a uh, local dimension two, uh, the number of parameters grows very fast. Now, um, is the size of the Hilbert space the problem of, uh, of uh, many body quantum system? Partially, yes, but uh, uh, from uh, uh, quantum information, we have learned that in some cases we can kind of uh, find a, a way around this exponential complexity. And what is the main driving idea here? Well, the, the main driving idea is that we actually uh, can look at the amount of correlation that uh, a certain region of the system share with the rest of the system. And for example, if the system is, in, is a product state, then there is absolutely no correlation. But if the system is entangled, uh, uh, there is a, a certain amount of correlation between uh, region A and B. So here uh, the system is uh, represented by this line with dots. The dots are, uh, if you want, the constituent. A is a sub-region of the system. And then we say that the, the state of the system is entangled if uh, uh, there is some kind of correlation between A and B. Okay. And how do we measure this correlation? Well, one way to measure this correlation is to trace out the degrees of freedom living in B. So this leaves leave us a possibly mixed state. And by studying the von Neumann entropy of that mixed state, so um, we, we, we call this the entanglement entropy, we have a measure of how much these uh, systems are entangled. Okay, so now that we know what uh, entanglement entropy is, we can use it as a kind of witness on how complex a certain um, state is to represent. Um, ah, sorry, this should go later. So um, let's start with the, this is the idea behind tensor network, as we all know. So we have this uh, exponentially large co uh, tensor of coefficient, and we re-express it in terms of a contraction of smaller tensors. So the diagram diagrammatic notation is such that this 
a, a big ball represent the tensor and the legs here, the dangling legs represent the indices. And so here we see that we have re-expressed that tensor as a, as a contraction. So when we connect to tensor, we are doing a contraction to them of smaller pieces. And in particular, this is a matrix pro state. But let's analyze a bit better what the matrix pro state is. And then uh, matrix pro state is a kind of generalization, a generalization of the product state. The product state we, we saw that um, is a state that has no uh, correlation between constituents and we can specify it by giving n vectors. So if the Hilbert space, the local Hilbert space is dimension D, we need D to the D times n numbers. A matrix product state is a generalization in which now um, the tensor or coefficient is, is uh, given by the trace of the product of certain matrices. So in order to specify a matrix product state, we need to give uh, D, uh, where D is the number of states of the local Hilbert space times N, when N is the number of constituent, D times D matrices, okay? So we, we still need to give um, a number of, uh, parameters that grows with the system size, but now only linearly, assuming that this, uh, the size of these matrices doesn't change, okay? And, and so obviously this is generalization of product state because these states uh, some kind have some correlation, so encode some correlation between co constituents. And, uh, but one of the things that we can um, see, and I will uh, explain it in a minute, is that the amount of correlation on, uh, that um, uh, a region A of the uh, of a state described by a matrix pro state has with the region B is bounded by a certain number, um, and in particular by the logarithm of D, where D is the size of the matrix, D square, okay? And why is that? Well, one can see that actually, given the structure of tensor networks, so tensor network can have different structure and matrix pro state have this linear structure here. The amount of entanglement between a region and its complement, this complement is upper bounded by the uh, logarithm of the bond dimension, these things here, times the number of bonds I have to cut. In this case, two. So uh, logarithm, two log of D is equal to log D squared. Okay, and so if we generalize tensor network to, to different construction, we see that actually the amount of entanglement the region has can change and also is scaling with respect to the system size. So we have here the case of what is called projected entanglement pair states, that is the natural generalization of matrix pro state to, to dimension. And we see that here we have a square region of L times L spins, and we need to cut L uh, of the order L for L actually uh, links to connect the interior to the exterior. And so we see here also that um, the entanglement is limited by the size of the boundary. And this is what, what is called the uh, area law. So let me go back to the area law slide that I don't know why it was there. And so we, we see that we have certain class of states that are described by tensor network that obey what we call the area law. So the, the entanglement of a region only scale with the size of the boundary rather than, and so the area rather than the volume. And actually um, tensor networks, or at least the tensor network that I showed you uh, until now, uh, in principle should encode properly these kind of states. Uh, and as the bond dimension increases, it has this region in, uh, of the full Hilbert states become larger, but actually still exponentially small with respect to the full Hilbert space. And so somehow the dimensionality of the Hilbert space is not really the limiting uh, fact in this um, analysis that I'm doing, but the scaling of entanglement is, okay? So let's go to some practical example and let's take the, our uh, beloved Ising model in transverse field. So here we are again in one dimension and we have constituent arranged um, along the line and we have an Hamiltonian that is given by two pieces. One is a two-body interaction uh, with the sigma x poly operator uh, on their nearest neighbors. And then we have what we call a transverse field and we have an angle here uh, that uh, allow us to parameterize the phase. So for theta equals zero, basically uh, this, uh, this uh, cotangent is, is um, infinite. And we are in this, what we call paramagnetic z, z polarized phase. It's the gap phase, this order phase, whether for theta equal um, uh, pi half, uh, this cotangent is zero. And then we are in what we call ferromagnetic order phase 
x polarized phase. In between, a pi divided by four, we have a, a second order phase transition that separates the two. Uh, that is described at low energy by um, a conformal field theory with central charge one half. Okay, so this is somehow a paradigmatic uh, system that has two uh, gapped phase separated by a second order phase transition. So let's see how the entanglement scales in this system, and this was done in this paper in 2004 for the first time numerically. Um, we see that if we take an infinite system and we look at the region of L spins, we have two possibility. Either the entanglement doesn't grow with the size of the system after a certain, let's say, um, transient. And this is the case in which actually this theta is such that it's different from uh, the critical point. We have a gap system and we have the area law. And so matrix pure state with finite bond dimension should be the correct answer to capture this kind of physics, okay? Or alternatively, we can be exactly at the critical point. So we take here pi divided by four and we see that the entanglement entropy would grow logarithmically with the size of the, of the block and they would eventually diverge. And so actually since MPS we said have a bounded entanglement entropy, MPS can be considered as the wrong answer to represent this, this uh, region. And in this, in this case, this specific point of the phase diagram. Okay. Uh, so on the other hand, as I said, for theta different from pi four, we can use uh, the matrix flow state because the entropy follows an area law, whether for theta equal pi divided by four, um, Gifre Vidal um, introduced this uh, beautiful answer that is called Mira, that basically kind of encode the, the fact that at that critical point, the system is scale invariant. So we, we explicitly, explicitly implement one of the symmetry of the system. So we have different layers of tensor, each, one, each layer address a different scale. And you see that actually now to separate one region, we have to cut one uh, or, a, or two, if you want, legs for each uh, length scale. And, and then this, this uh, answer naturally encode this logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy with the size of the region, okay? Uh, and so this would be what I would call the correct tensor letter answer to analyze the critical point. Okay, question how to hear us. That would be kind of the background. Okay, I hope that you still listen to me. Um, so if there are no questions, I, I keep going. Okay, so all what I said up to now was related to the equilibrium. What happened if we go out of equilibrium? And one possibility to go out of equilibrium is actually to perform a quench. So let me first define what is a quench. Uh, hopefully everyone knows, but basically the idea is that we start from the ground state of our Hamiltonian. Uh, here we'll always use the same example just to be concrete. So we take our uh, 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 transverse field um, using Hamiltonian at certain value theta zero of the parameter here, and we construct the ground state of it. And then we abruptly change theta zero to theta one and we let the state evolve under the new Hamiltonian. So in, in general, this state is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian for a different value of theta because the Hamiltonian is, is uh, frustrated. Then this state would be a, a superposition of exponentially many um, uh, uh, excited state, and this will generate a non-trivial evolution. Okay, and here, for example, I can quench from theta zero deep in the paramagnetic phase to theta one very close to the critical point, for example. There are plenty of review about quenches, so I, I don't have uh, time to um, explain all the, the details of the things. But what I'm interested in is a very old result by uh, Calabrese and Cade of 2005 that again shows how the entanglement entropy of the region behaves as a function of time after uh, the quench. And so you see that now the entanglement entropy glow, grows linearly in time and it saturates to a value that actually, again, grows um, linearly with the size of the block, right? So, so this state here are states that have a volume low. So we start from a low entangled state that is a ground state. So we know that it has, a, unless we are at the critical point, it has an area low entanglement. In time, the entropy grows very fast linearly, and then it saturates to something that is volume low. Okay, and this was uh, 
something uh, discussed in this paper uh, of 2005. So what is the explanation? Why is that happening? Well, at least in this kind of system, so the, this fact is more general and, and can be probably um, explained in terms of Libra Robinson bound, but at least for this kind of system, there is a very uh, neat physical explanation of what's going on. And the idea is that we have a kind of low energy uh, dispersion relations for the Hamiltonian transition invariant, momentum is a good quantum number. And so we have kind of energy bands and uh, uh, we have excitation um, there are kind of, uh, if you want, uh, uh, single particle excitation or single particle like excitation. And this excitation have a well defined um, group velocity, they have a certain momentum and a well defined group velocity. So as we um, start from an initial state that is a ground state of the Hamiltonian in another place, as I said, this has an exponentially large overlap with many uh, excited states. And so from the practical point of view, we create um, certain excitation that I have to have zero momentum because the state is transition invariant, the Hamiltonian is transition invariant, but they, they are built from a uh, wave packet that move on uh, to the left and uh, to the right with um, uh, the two corresponding uh, uh, group velocity. And so this, um, let's say, um, region were originally correlated because uh, the state has short range correlations. So they start from, uh, the same, uh, the same. Uh, these these two wave packets start from the same region, so they share some correlation. And as they propagate, they spread and they radiate this correlation to long distance. And actually, if you uh, follow this picture, imagine that you are in a block. So originally, um, there are no uh, separated um, pseudo particle, but after some time, there are pseudo particle travel. So this is a this is a picture of a block on the right, and this is again the entanglement entropy. So uh, at the beginning, all uh, pseudo particles are close by. So when we cut, basically, we only have the short range correlation of the ground state. But then as time goes by, those pseudo particles that are correlated with, uh, with the blue pseudo particle, there is one red traveling to the left and one blue traveling to the right. So when the, the red enters the block, it brings some correlation with something that is outside. And the same has happened on the other boundary. So a blue entered the block, and there is a red outside that is correlated with it and traveling in the opposite direction. And as time goes by, there is this fluid of zero particle that enters your region, and they little by little kind of um, occupy more and more space, let's say, until we arrive to a, 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 to a stationary situation in which the blue zero fluid of zero particle keeps traveling to the right, the red keeps traveling to the left, but we have already um, arrived to a situation in which we have a volume low because each of these zero particle uh, is entangled with some some other one that is far away, okay? So that's a bit the, the kind of physical interpretation of what's, what is going on. And it was again proposed in this paper. Um, so this is the origin of the complexity, but as a result, we see that we have this uh, entanglement barrier. So what can we do about it? And in order to think, uh, well, obviously one could think uh, we, we can use a quantum computer, fine. So if we want to wait for a quantum computer, go for it. The, the question is, what can we do now with the uh, classical tools, right? And, and the idea is to try to uh, learn, again, something from equilibrium. So let me go back to equilibrium uh, for another 10 minutes or 10, 15 minutes, and then we will come back to the bridge. So let's, uh, again, go to characterize criticality in one and two dimension with, with tensor network. And as I said, if we look at the entanglement scaling of, uh, of a region in a, in a 1D system, for example, we, we decided that for matrix flow state, this was a good region where we could get almost exact results. And this was a bad region where basically if we keep the bond dimension constant, we cannot uh, capture the entanglement scale. So the point is that if we want to study this uh, kind of interesting uh, region where we have some very non-trivial uh, collective phenomena appearing. Um, we, with, uh, if you want the wrong tensor network answers, we are bound to uh, encounter approximation. And uh, the, the question is, what can we learn from this approximation and with this approximate result, okay? Obviously, there is always the alternative to use the exact tensor network, but let's, for the moment, study what happens if we apply the wrong tensor network 
or the, the, the tensor network uh, that is exact in, uh, let's say, in the gap phase into the critical regime where that is not a regime where we should use it. Okay, and actually the idea would be then to extrapolate what we learned here to use tensor network in the wrong regime of the out of equilibrium dynamic. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the subject of this uh, chapter. So wrong and correct tensor network at equilibrium uh, at the critical point. So let's do um, what. So I will present it in a slightly different way from what, the way in which discover we in which we discovered this phenomenon. But let's do it in this way for the sake of. Uh, Simplicity. So imagine that you have your critical uh, Hamiltonian, the Ising at theta equal pi divided by four, the cotangent is one, so that's the critical point. And we have um, this system that is a one dimensional system wrapped on a, on a circumference, so we have a circle of sides L, right? And uh, we try to see what happens if we uh, compute the ground state of the system with matrix flow state with fixed bond dimension D, and we increase the sides of the circle, okay? So the results are presented in this uh, plot here, that it's a bit dense. So here what I plot is the uh, difference. So the, the, the model is exactly solvable, so we can compute the exact ground state energy. And so here what I plot is the difference in, in the ground state energy for a, a given um, system uh, of uh, sites N with respect to the infinite, um, to the infinite um, case, right? And we know that this difference goes down as one over n squared because we're in periodic boundary condition. Actually, the, this slope is universal. It, it has to do um, uh, with the central charge, but uh, we don't care for the moment about this. So the, the, the point is that in this plot, this is the log of the system sides. This is the error in the energy. And if we were able to obtain the correct result, they should lie on this black, black line here, okay? So the colored curves, on the other hand, are the results of this matrix flow state simulation with fixed bond dimension. And uh, the bond dimension increases for different colors, okay? And so what we observe is something we expected that for very small system size, given a, a certain bond dimension, let's say D equal four, we can exactly reproduce what we would expect um, um, from the theory for a certain system size, but then our results start to deviate. So the bond dimension is not large enough to encode the exact state. And we see some strange peak here. And then we enter into a regime where the error in the energy doesn't depend anymore on the system size. You see it becomes flat, but actually it does depend on the bond dimension. So you see that if I take a different bond dimension, first of all, this transition is moved uh, to larger system sides, but uh, at some point, again, my, my accuracy is saturated. I cannot lower the energy uh, more than a certain uh, uh, value. These are variational states, so the energy will be always higher uh, than the exact value. But this, this, um, this value is, is independent on the system size. And actually, if you now plot these last uh, points as a function of the bond dimension, we see, again, the appearance of a different power law. So here it was a power law one over n squared. And here we have a power law uh, one over d, the bound dim the dim dimension to some exponent that I call minus two kappa. Okay. Uh, and actually, one way to understand what's going on is to realize that given the finite bond dimension, what is happening is that there is an emerging correlation length, finite correlation length that is function of this bond dimension with this uh, kind of crossover exponent kappa. And uh, the, the, um, so all the data that I showed before collapse into a single curve. When, once I realize, I, I express everything as I should in a scaling plot uh, with respect to the ratio between the sides and this new uh, length that is induced by the bond dimension. You see that I get um, a universal curve. Okay, and this is what we uh, initially dubbed finite entanglement scaling, and then for a reason that will be clear in a, a moment, now we call finite correlation scaling. So basically, uh, what we see is actually that our results improve polynomially with the bond dimension, 
because of this fact that the correlation length uh, uh, increases polynomially with one dimension. And actually, this is very similar to what we see in a mirror. So here, these are the results taken from a paper by, by Glenn and Giffrey in 2013. And you see that actually also for the MIRA, the ground state energy behaves in a very similar manner. So it's a different power law. So the exponent is different, but still power law with respect to bond dimension of the optimized MIRA, okay? Um, so from the point of view, at least of the energy, there is not such a big difference in using uh, the correct or the wrong uh, tensor network answer. Now, in the paper, Glenn and Ifre make a comparison of correlation uh, length uh, or, uh, or two-point correlation function. But I guess it's an unfair comparison because what you would really like to do is to compare the value of the critical exponent. And as we already described, even uh, Tomotoshi that was the, actually the first to observe uh, this phenomenon in the context of classical partition function studied with the coordinate transfer matrix. Um, we already described that once you see such uh, emerging correlation length, the way to extract the critical exponent is not to by fitting to point correlation function, but it is actually to perform a finite size scaling or finite correlation scaling analysis and to study how these things vary with the correlation length. So you have a handle on the correlation length. So you should rather study something like that and extract the exponent. And we already described this in a, a lot of details in back in 2008. So by 2013, this idea were already around uh, 2011, sorry, when, when Glenn and Ifred did the, 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 the paper. So I think that correct um, um, comparison to know if the critical exponent uh, are better in one case or the other would be to study um, to study how how and how your results uh, depend on um, so how we are which precision you get by performing the scaling analysis. Obviously, the correct tensor network answer is much more elegant, and it allows you to extract directly, if you want, from an eigenvalue equation, the critical exponent and things. So from the point of view of, of theory, it's much more uh, clean, and it's, 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 it's uh, if you want, much cleaner how you do these things. But if you are a, a numerical physicist uh, doing, for example, Monte Carlo, everyone knows that uh, uh, critical exponent are extracted through finite size scaling, and in this case, through finite correlation length scaling. Okay, uh, and then obviously um, things have improved a lot during the years. Uh, the GAN group uh, has uh, now a slightly different uh, variation of the scaling answers uh, that works also for GAP system. But the main idea was already there from uh, probably Tomotoshi paper, and then. Uh, we kind of made it explicit in the in the context of, uh, of matrix flow state. Now, okay, so let's go to 2D. So in 2D, the, the situation of the scaling of the entanglement at a critical point is much more complicated. You can have uh, several things. You can have uh, a gap phase in which you have the area law. You can have a critical phase in which you have a zero dimensional Fermi surface, and then you have again an area law. And then you can have one dimensional Fermi surfaces, and then you have an L log L scaling of the entropy. So as I already showed, the PEPs, there are the generalization of matrix flow state to two dimension, naturally encode state that obey the area law. So in principle, PEPs in two dimension are the correct answer to study two dimensional critical system, okay? This table again is extracted by this uh, beautiful paper by Glenn and Frey about geometry and tensor network state. Um, so uh, with Philippe Corbo, we decided to test what happened with PEPs in the case in which we have a, a critical point with this uh, zero dimensional uh, Fermi surface. And the system here is a system of fermions, uh, spinless fermions that hops on, on, uh, on this um, hexagonal lattice. And they are also subject to the nearest, um, uh, nearest neighbor uh, repulsion. Okay, so when V is zero, we just have three fermions hopping on this hexagonal lattice and we are in the semi-metal phase. When V becomes infinite, you, you can immediately imagine that we go to a kind of uh, mot insulating phase in which we have, uh, or charge density way in which we have uh, side, a half filling at least, we have only one fermion every second side in such a way that we don't feel the, the, um, the presence of their neighbors. And so this term is minimized. And, Another parameter for the transition is the difference of occupation between A and B sub lattices. 
okay? And these as these things here, the location of the transition was computed in uh, Monte Carlo because at, at half feeling there is no sign problem by uh, uh, in this paper here. And so uh, uh, Philip decided to check what was going on with hypeps. And so you see, this is the critical line, the location of the critical line. And we would expect from the previous plot here, we would expect that the magnetization should be zero at the critical point. Okay, the magnetization goes to zero with T minus the critical to the beta. Okay. Um, but you see clearly that the magnetization is not zero in the in a IPEP simulation, okay? So here we have different bond dimensions. So the, the magnetization is going to zero with the bond dimension. Here we, we show that actually there is an extra parameter in the IPEP simulation because uh, you cannot contract the uh, IPEP exactly, but you have to approximate the contraction. You have some boundary um, uh, uh, bond dimension or the size of the, if you want your, your your corner transfer matrix, whatever. So you have an extra parameter that you need to extrapolate. And here we show that actually uh, there is a finite correlation length for any value of this um, um, uh, kind of refinement parameter that only depends on the different bond dimension. Okay. And once you realize that, again, you actually see what you expect that the magnetization goes down with the correlation length with the, cor with the correct exponent beta. Okay, and this is uh, all described in this paper here. I don't want to go too much into the details because the point is not the details of this work, it's more the kind of philosophy behind it. Okay, so what we, what we see is that even though we are using once more the correct tensor network as we did with the MIRA in 1D, so even the, the, the PEPs in 2D that should uh, 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 kind of host or support the correct entanglement scaling, show exactly the same phenomenology than the MPS in, in, uh, in one year at the critical point. Why is that? So that's the big question. And my way of understanding is, is that actually that's the kind of uh, what the univer universality does for us. So let me just review what I mean by universality. So a very down to her definition is that uh, uh, at the critical point, Things do not depend too much on the details of the model, but very different models. For example, if you add second uh, uh, nearest nearest neighbor uh, interaction, the ASI model, uh, or you you look at completely uh, different model uh, in the same universality class. For example, uh, 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 ice and and water, or binary mixture, or things like that. So when there is a critical point with a certain symmetry. At, at very large distances, so for, at distances much larger than, than um, the lattice spacing and somehow smaller than the correlation length, uh, all, the, all the correlation function decay with the same universal, as power law, with the same universal exponent. Okay? And this set of exponents, plus uh, something else, uh, I don't want to go too much into detail, define well, a universality class. And so, one important part of the universality class is this collection of critical exponents. So what, what's happening from my point of view with this tensor network? So what, what happens is that by approximating uh, locally the state, by minimizing the energy, what we manage to do, we manage to enter what we call the scaling region. So very close to a critical point due to this universality, there is what is called scaling hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that whatever happens can be uh, interpret in terms of a, an effective correlation length. And by kind of tuning that correlation length for a certain uh, range of parameter, you are able to explore the critical region and you are able to extract the critical exponent because uh, the, the critical point dictates how your system reacts to your uh, finite correlation length. And, and from the point of view of the, uh, let's say, uh, RG, um, picture of the thing is that we have a, a, an unstable critical point here. We have a tensor network that arrives somehow close to here, but for any finite bond dimension, there is a certain approximation. And this approximation naturally would kind of decompose onto, onto scaling fields. And it would be a kind of a miracle if you would numerically be able only to uh, kind of couple to uh, uh, irrelevant uh, perturbation. Typically, what you also do is uh, numerically, you would couple to some relevant perturbation. And so uh, 
by by in, improving your your by improving your uh, approximation, your coupling to the uh, relevant perturbation gets smaller, and then you increase the correlation, and then you get closer and closer to the critical point. Okay, so it it is very important that there is this critical point and there is this universality, and that's what save us in using the wrong answers to extract. Um, the correct information. Okay, if there was not such a critical point, not such a universal uh, universality around it, probably we wouldn't be able to set up this scaling uh, procedure that allow us to extract the critical information. Okay, so this is the main message from equilibrium, and I pause here in case there are questions on this part. Maybe I have one. I mean, like fr from these scaling ansatz in 2D, can you make any statements about how well mirror is then suitable for actually representing critical states in 2D? So I think the, the statement would be uh, pretty similar. So uh, I don't know uh, what, what's the stage of the 2D uh, simulation at the critical point with the mirror. So what, what's the stage of the, the critical exponent? But I would expect, so, uh, Glenn has a fantastic paper on uh, wavelets and mira, in which he shows that there is actually finite bound dimension uh, uh, mira for the 1D uh, system in transverse field. As in system in transverse field, that is basically exact, right? So where, where um, the fact that he has a finite bond dimension doesn't happen, open the gap. But with the numerically optimized mira from the algorithm, mm -hmm. you can immediately see that your bond dimension uh, immediately makes your kind of fixed point Hamiltonian uh, gapped in the sense that after a few uh, scaling um, transformation of this uh, fixed point Hamiltonian, uh, the, the dispersion relations uh, uh, is not linear anymore. So it, it gets a small quadratic part. And so uh, unless you have a, an analytical uh, construction of a 2D mirror, uh, then pro probably I would expect that that's the same thing and then you get uh, find, uh, again, a polynomial um, polynomial accuracy in terms of the bond dimension that comes from the fact that this bond dimension somehow opens a gap. Right, so this way the mirror would not be that different. So so basically then yes. it would open up a gap, right? So, yes. so basically there's some fine at least, at least the numerically optimized one. So yes, I, exactly. I'm not saying so that's that what it, it, yes. Because like in 2D PEPs is similar, so you can write down 2D PEPs with critical correlations like RK wave function or something like yes. this. But you wouldn't find them yes. from a numerical exactly. optimization. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, so um, so now now it should be clear that I would be very interested in finding something on the same footing of a critical point in the, in the out of equilibrium evolution. Okay, because if I would be able to do that, then uh, my hope would be that I could use whatever wrong answers approximate uh, the, the, the kind of critical point, this uh, kind of critical point, and then set up a scaling theory to extrapolate the result that I would obtain uh, into uh, the limit in which uh, I would extract the correct one. Okay, and so this is a quest of, for universality in questions. And uh, actually, the, um, this is work in progress. Uh, with Eric, uh, Tony at CISA, and Jacopo that was my PhD student when I was at Strackler, and now he's working at ICFO in the group of Tony and CISA. And so uh, here also I have to review uh, briefly what is known at equilibrium. So let me, let me basically rephrase what I said already, that uh, the entanglement grows fast out of equilibrium. Uh, and so, uh, there are many interesting questions that we cannot address from first principle. Um, and we can either try to devise better techniques, uh, tensor network techniques, and uh, um, uh, Frank had a, a, a proposal with matrix pro state. We also have, have one along the same line. There have been ideas using mixed state. There is this branching mirror that probably could be used, or this uh, spectral tensor network that could be used in certain, in certain situation. But, um, but alternatively, we can try to identify this universal phenomena that allows us to simulate quenches with simple tensor network, like, for example, matrix pro state. 
So let me, uh, in order to to discuss these things, oh, okay. So here there is a problem, but let me let me um, introduce a definition. So what, what we call entanglement Hamiltonian. So given the reduced density matrix over region A, this is a positive definite uh, uh, matrix. It's a state, and so we can take the logarithm of it, and we define the entanglement Hamiltonian and its spectrum. Okay. So the entanglement spectrum uh, as this. Uh, this is just the eigenvalue sorry, of this entanglement Hamiltonian. And in order to identify possible uh, interesting spectra, what we will really do most of the time will be to consider gaps of this uh, guy here and ratio of the gaps. In this way, we can get rid of arbitrary energy shift and rescaling uh, of the Hamiltonian. That Actually, so if you shift and rescale Hamiltonian, so for example, the ice model, you don't change the fact that you are dealing with the ice model. So it's always the ice model. Obviously, the, uh, the energy level change, but um, the gaps also change if you rescale uh, the, the Hamiltonian, but the ratio of the gaps stays the same. Okay. And so already at equilibrium, there was a, a beautiful paper by Anders Lockland in uh, 2013. Some some uh, calculation uh, in in, certain, in the context of uh, corner transfer matrices uh, from CFT, but uh, let's say there was not a unified view of what was contained in the entanglement spectrum. Actually, there was a paper that would claim that the entanglement spectrum would only contain central charges, only the entropies. But Andreas showed that actually that's not the case. At the entanglement spectrum, the lower part of it, encodes actually the critical exponent of the uh, corresponding, always, sorry, at the critical point, okay? So I'm always at the kind of uh, conformally invariant critical point or always invariant critical point. Uh, and this, uh, this is the numeric from this paper that Andreas decided not to publish. So it's only in the archive, but it's a, one, one of, I think, a beautiful paper. Uh, so please go and, 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 and have a look to it. And, and you see here that um, there is this pattern. So there is this pattern of, um, of levels that are somehow are the ones that are expected from from uh, the ising um, the ising uh, spectrum on a certain uh, uh, geometry. It's a strip with free uh, boundary condition on both sides. Okay. So this paper, I think, uh, uh, I I hope that uh, that was the uh, the the reason for for uh, um, uh, Cardi and. Uh, and told me to revisit um, the, the way in which you compute entanglement in, in conformal field theory and to actually um, um, focus on the, on the original proposal in which you basically uh, compute entanglement by using a, a set of conformal mappings from, from what you would like to do. So here you have uh, the two extreme of your, of your interval and a cut in between. So you do a set of conformal mapping and you map your things to Again, a strip, okay. Of with here, there is a, a W. There should be a W here. It's important. So a W here. That's the width of the strip, okay. This this W A. And actually, one of the results of this paper is that, as uh, Andreas showed numerically already, in the gap of the entanglement spectrum, you should find the gap of the CFT uh, spectrum. Uh, the CFT implies that the same a critical exponent that you see in correlation function actually appear as spectrum in of the theory on cylinder or on a ring, if you want, as a finite size correction to your, to your spectrum. And so here is the same. You see there is a kind of a factor that depends on the size of your interval in a logarithmic way. And then there are these gaps. Okay, and that's the if you want CFT explanation of the results by Andreas. Now, what happened in quench? So in our paper, we discussed uh, three different scenarios. Here, we just focus on the quench to the critical point, because this is the one that I think is understood from the CFT point of view. The other one is just understood from or kind of conjecture from the numerical analysis. So let's quench the critical point. And actually, if you quench to the critical point, you can again use CFT, but I will get to that in a, in a second. So first of all, if you quench in the same phase and look at the entanglement spectrum, so here is the inverse of the entanglement gap. GR, we say, is the, the entanglement gap. So it's the inverse of the entanglement gap. So the inverse of the entanglement gap grows, meaning that the entanglement gap shrink. 
But you see that there is a finite gap here at the end of your, um, let's say, uh, so again, here you see the entropy, linear growth, and then saturation, okay? Um, so this is the, the part in which the entropy grows and then it's saturated. But you see that no matter where you look at it, so there are some uh, eigenvalue of the reducency matrix that start to appear, but the gap is, uh, is fixed, okay? And here, the, these are two different scenarios, but the, 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 um, let's say there is no, no difference into that, okay? So the, now what happens if you quench to the critical point? Well, you see the situation is very different. Again, the entropy, this is the entropy linear growth and equilibration. So we see these gaps that start to close, but then also here, there seems to be no gap. There seem to be gaps related to some kind of finite size effect. And we will discuss in a, in a little what it, what it means. So we see some very, very peculiar structure, okay? Very regular structure of this entanglement spectrum. And again, here in this case, these are the eigenvalues so the gap before I show the inverse gap, here the, the gaps is really the distance between different lines, okay? So you see that uh, at the beginning, uh, it was pretty large, if you want, here, and then it shrinks, okay? And so this regime here, forget them, because they are due to the fact that the system is finite, then uh, this pseudo particle go around the circle and blah, blah, blah. So it's not important for what I want to discuss today. Okay, and it turns out that, uh, Again, one can explain the things, in, at least in certain limits, using um, CFT. And the picture here is a picture, again, uh, that was uh, first proposed in this paper by 2000, in 2005 by Carmen Calabrese, and then uh, kind of reanalyzed in, in a bit more detail in this paper by Carmen in 2016. The picture is that you can, again, map your system into to a strip, if you want. This is uh, the, the, the partition function so this would be the geometry of your partition function that you have to compute in order to compute these uh, things, which your interval A is off the center of the strip by a certain amount that I call it T that has to do actually with the time. And tau zero is something that has to do with the initial state. And uh, I, I won't enter into detail, but the prediction from the CFT is that the entropy grows linearly, and you see the central charge here appearing, but there is this tau zero that is related to the initial state. So depending on the initial state, you get different slopes, if you want. And again, the gaps show the critical exponent, again, with a certain factor here that is again to do with the central charge, the inverse time. So the gaps are closing, the gaps of the entanglement spectrum. They are closing uh, as one over T, following the CFT prediction. And there is, again, this, this uh, uh, combination of constant in front. The interesting thing is that this is a, a prediction for an infinite, an half infinite system. So an half is infinite line of an infinite system as a function of time. And so in a kind of finite sides setting in which you have a finite chain, so this prediction you can expect at most to work at very short time. Okay, because after a certain amount of time, actually you start to see that your system is finite or that your block is finite, and then, and then you can't apply this formula anymore. But there is a second limit in which you can um, hope to apply some result coming from CFT. It's actually uh, the idea that if you wait long enough, we are in this saturation plateau of the entropy. So we can expect that the system is in a Gibbs state Actually, it's not, but let's for the moment assume that it is in a Gibbs state. Um, so that locally, the reduced density matrix should be indistinguishable by, from the reduced density matrix of the Gibbs state. And then we can use, again, the, the CFT results um, that uh, tell you how is the entanglement spectrum for the thermal state, for a block in the thermal state. And again, beta should be large enough such that the CFT is a good approximation, obviously. And, uh, but should it still be small enough such that the correlation length induced uh, from, uh, from, um, from beta is smaller than the size of the system. Because again, this is a result from CFT in the infinite uh, limit, okay? So we have these two results and actually, basically they are summarized here. So we again have some W, so it's the width of the strip and both the entropy increases with W and somehow by the one over W correction in the, in, the, in the gaps. 
So actually the gaps have a one over W correction, so they, they go to zero in, in the same way they would do on a, in a finite system. So one over L, if you want, if you um, uh, remember. And the, the three factor here are the critical exponent. And this W, depending on the, on the two limit that we consider, is either a function of beta or a function of T and tau zero, okay? Uh, but the important thing is, again, that if we look at the ratio of the gaps, we should be able to extract the critical exponent, okay? And if we look at this combination of uh, gap times entanglement entropy also, okay? And so that's the numerics that we did in this paper here. And here we actually see two regimes uh, for a reason that I will explain in the following, but uh, if you have followed the discussion, you had already understood. I call this regime a kind of pre-thermalization and this regime, I call it uh, thermalization. Why I call this regime in this way? Well, here again, I see the inverse gap that they actually are closing, are growing linearly with time, meaning that the gap are closing uh, linearly with time, and then they saturate. But if I now plot the ratio of the gap, from the ratio of the gap here in this pre-thermalized regime, you see that actually, so there, there is a, a detail here that there is a gap that is not there in this, uh, in this uh, thermalization regime, but actually nothing happens, okay? So I always read the same critical exponent, meaning that I could interpret the state as a thermal state with a temperature that depends on time in a very simple way, actually linearly with time. But if I look at the ratio of the, of the, of the, of the gaps, no, this, 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 uh, there is nothing happening. Okay, and, and I see the critical exponent. So this is why I call it kind of pre-thermalization. It's a very different notion of pre-thermalization with that, what typically people use. So please take it into, into uh, let's say, quotes. Okay, so that's what we see from the Asimov. So we actually see, so the important thing is that this is completely universal, okay? So we see the emergence of this critical exponent uh, uh, we have an explanation for the lack of this uh, guy here and the presence of it here due to the fact that we have two boundaries and then we have two tensor product, two CFT at the beginning and then just one in the thermalization regime. We see this kind of abrupt transition. That is when the entropy passes from linear growth to saturation. But in both regimes, we are able to extract the critical response. So we have one Hamiltonian that is becoming gapless, the entanglement Hamiltonian. It becomes gapless in a very universal way as time goes by. And so maybe that's the way in which we should set up a scaling theory that we are actually trying to do since uh, this, this result here. So since a couple of, of years. And so there, there are some, there is at least one ca caveat that one has to consider. And it's actually the fact that all what I said is kind of numerically uh, computed in the context of a free model, right? The Eisen model is free. So what happens if we include interaction? And that's what we are kind of working on with uh, Neil Robertson, that is uh, now uh, a postdoc in, uh, in the institute I work in, uh, uh, and he works together with me and Sofia Nibel is there. And so uh, we, we have tried to repeat the same thing for the three states pots model. The three state pots model is this Hamiltonian. So here now instead of putting an angle, I put J and F hopping, and if you want, um, uh, chemical potential or whatever you want to call it or transverse field. Uh, and so at J divided by F equal to two, we have a transition from a paragamagnetic uh, tau polarized state for large F and a ferromagnetic um, uh, sigma polarized state for uh, small F. Okay, and at J equal F equal to two, we have this transition that is that should be described at the low energy again by uh, a CFT, again, a minimal, uh, that is a minimal model with central charge four divided by five. And these uh, uh, operators here, the generalization of the Pauli matrices in for the Z3 group. So now instead of having a, a, a diagonal one minus one, you have phases here. And uh, this is the equivalent of the sigma x if you want that flips from zero to one, okay? And, and now it's a cyclic, um, cyclic operator. So the, bottom, so the Hilbert space dimension here is three, okay? It has zero, one, and two. Okay, so what happens if we start to consider the, 
entanglement spectrum at equilibrium at the critical point. Well, this was actually already observed by in this original paper by Andreas Lockley. The only things that uh, we kind of uh, were able to do is since we now have a CFT uh, prediction, we are able to identify the correct scaling variable is W. And we can see that in order to match, so this is a, these are various partition in the system of size 128. So the, the by partition goes from, I don't know, two spins to, uh, to 60, whatever, 64 spins, right? All possible by partition. So if you express the spectrum of uh, all of these by partition as function of, of small L and, L and, uh, and big L with the correct uh, formula, then you see that you have actually still large correction to scaling. So you, we need it up to second order, um, um, effects to fit up to second order of one over omega. So it's, uh, these, these lines are uh, uh, extracted by using up to one over omega square uh, effects. And we actually get to the expected value that we would expect for a, a, a POTS model on a free, uh, free um, uh, strip, okay? So these are the expected value and the degeneracy of the gaps. So the, the um, equilibrium um, results uh, turn out to be the one that we expected, but there is a surprise out of equilibrium. And actually here, uh, I show you uh, some preliminary results that we have for system size 64 and a block of a quarter of, of the system size. Actually, uh, all, all those of you that have done uh, numerical simulation of the outer equilibrium dynamics know that more or less, there is a hard cutoff at around t over j equal 10. So this beyond that, the things become very, I mean, it's obviously exponentially hard as time passes, but generally we are able to increase the So we could, we could have gone to something like 3000 or something like that on a larger computer, but on normal computer uh, already, uh, one dimension of the order of the thousand are, are pretty large. And so what we see is actually that here, the entanglement entropy grows and then saturates for different uh, partition size. But you start to see some strange effect here that, for example, this line goes down where you would expect that it would stay up. And again, it's at times of the order larger than 10, okay? So here, the bond dimension is already too small, okay? To, to, to trust the results. But at least for, let's say, time, times up to eight, I think that we are safe. So from zero to eight, we are safe. And again, we see this kind of a strange initial um, uh, initial uh, uh, behavior that we cannot explain. But then here, we clearly see a linear growth of entropy here. So we expect that this is what the CFT describes in some region here. But you see that the ratio are completely off to what we expect. And actually, we, we, we have tried several extrapolations uh, because there, there could be effects on uh, one over T uh, one over one over block uh, size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Since we miss the full CFT expression in this case, because we only have these limits in which time is very short, or or time is very large, so we don't know what is the correct scaling variable to use, and so we are unable to extract from these lines here what we expect should be the spectrum. And so the question is, is this actually going to work? So. Do we expect that for very large time and very large system size, we would reproduce the prediction from the CFT? And we actually think that's not the case, but we are still working on that. And so uh, somehow this, this was what stopped our, our analysis on this universality, because we already see that for the three-state POTS model, things are much more complicated than what we would have expected from the CFT analysis. And so with this, I conclude. So we hopefully have identified a new form of universality where we, that we could exploit to construct some kind of scaling theory for, for tensor network um, out of equilibrium. Using this scaling theory, it seems that the wave function in some way can be interpreted as a very simple uh, wave function. And, um, and so this we still haven't exploited in, in numerics. And the, the main question is, can actually, can we actually use this uh, observed criticality in the entanglement Hamiltonian to uh, set up a scaling theory? Uh, 
And let's say now I am a bit less confident after these, these uh, two results on the three state pods model. So we have this three state pods model that is the first example that we consider of interacting uh, model where things seems to be more complicated. And so there is something else there that we don't understand what it is. And then hopefully once we understand that, we could understand if we actually can uh, still set up a scaling theory or not. Okay. And uh, with this, I thank you very much. And i um, ready to take questions if there are. Thanks, Luca. Um, are other questions? Let me maybe start with one. So you were showing these results for the Ising model. And it seemed like at a certain time there was some kind of discontinuous behavior, right? Yes. So let me and know. now I wonder if you take the Ising model or the Ising critical point, but you would add to it some term, like for example, like some sort of self-dual term that would not destroy the Ising criticality, but remove the free fermion integrability. Did, did you try that? No, so exactly. So this is one of the things that uh, we actually, so we thought, uh, yes. Because I mean, yeah. I, I wonder, because when you are talking, like the, the free model, we would in the common sense not expect to thermalize. So I, I'm wondering to which extent do you actually see thermalization? Or yes, do you sorry, see exactly. artifacts of the of this being a free model? Okay, so uh, yes, so this is a, a very good question. The point is, that we know that this this thing should be a generalized Gibson sample. You no, know? so we know, and actually, mm -hmm. uh, there are analytical results about the fact that this should actually be a generalized Gibson sample. But what we are looking at is the very low energy part of these. Um, of this entanglement Hamiltonian. And uh, so from the point of view of, uh, so if you want, from the point of view of the, of the block, that's not very relevant because we are at finite energy density, right? So we are looking at the, at the very low energy part of the entanglement Hamiltonian while we know that we are at finite energy density. So from that point of view, uh, what, what I'm just observing is that the very low energy part of, if you want the, the reduced density matrix of a generalized Gibbs ensemble and the uh, low energy part of the reduced density matrix of a Gibbs state are actually indistinguishable. And we have the plots, uh, we have the plots in the appendix of our paper. So at least for the Eisen case, that's, that's what we get. So if you, if you build the GGE or uh, if you want the diagonal ensemble that we know how to build, and compute the reduced density matrix, the low energy part of it uh, is indistinguishable from the, uh, from the one that you get from a, uh, from a thermal state. So all effects of higher conserved quantity are probably higher in energy. So you would see them at some point in the spectrum, but they are irrelevant at low energy. I see, so basically you would say that even if you add an integrability breaking term to the Ising model, you will expect the same picture. I would expect the same thing, yes. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I would expect that at least this low energy part uh, should be universal. But I mean, um, I was low, but also, this is low energy in terms of the entanglement spectrum. Yes. So is the high energy. high energy in terms of the it's the finite energy density quench. Yes, indeed. So, but the, the point is exactly this one. So the gap are closing in the entanglement spectrum. So you are occupying more and more level in this uh, entanglement Hamiltonian. So somehow we are just looking at the low energy part that we expect to be described by the CFT. Obviously, we don't expect the middle of the spectrum to be described by the CFT at all, okay? Because, mm -hmm. because uh, we know that that's not the case. But the low energy part should still be described by the CFT. And I think that actually the reason why we see this uh, thermalization, because we really see that that's the exponential of, uh, of uh, the Hamiltonian, right? So we mm -hmm. see the same spectrum that we see in the Hamiltonian. So we see this thermalization just because we are looking at the low energy part of it. So uh, all the difference should be in, uh, in, um, mm -hmm. in the high energy thing. I and see. we actually compare the two and, and that's, that's what happened in, at least in Ising. Uh, 
right. yes. but still it would be interesting to see the DMRG data where you actually add yeah, interaction. Yes, and... yes. I, I actually, it's something. It's definitely something I want to do because uh, we believe that um, there is a role of integrability. On the other hand, in the pots uh, mm -hmm. case, so uh, we we expect that if we would break integrability in the pot case, probably things would work again. But mm -hmm. uh, but um, for some reason, uh, the pots model is is more complicated than. Uh, than the AI's model in terms of, of uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble, probably. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we, we believe. So this, uh, so there is still a spectrum, and it seems to be um, actually not very stable in this case. With so what I I didn't show it, but these results are very stable with respect to where do you start from. Okay, so the the, the quench, the, the initial point of the quench. Um, that's not the case for the pots. For the POTS model. So, for example, we see very, very uh, large deviation um, mm -hmm. depending on where we start from. And so the POTS model is much more complicated, and we still, we still don't have an understanding of what's going on. Thanks. Are there further questions? Maybe one, Luca. So thanks for the nice talk. Yes. So um, can you repeat again the argumentation when you had these um, these two regimes in which you had say one copy or two copies of, of the same zero plus one alt? Um, yeah. So this is. How should yes. I understand the? Yeah. So if you want, one? if you want, we said that we have. Uh, so we have a CFT. Um, uh, a CFT description of the very short time limit, right? In the very short time limit, the physics is local in the sense that pseudo particle had a very little time to travel. So they have explored very small regions, right? And so somehow you would expect that you have a CFT description for, oops, sorry, for, um, uh, you have a CFT description for these interacting boundary here and the CFT description for this interacting boundary here. So uh, you, could, you could think of it as this, this uh, interval was infinite and then we would have a tensor product of two half infinite chains, okay? One for the left boundary and the other for the right boundary. And at some point, these two things uh, see each other. So they mix in a strange way that we don't really understand. But the end results is what you would expect now in the thermalized regime, that you just have one single CFT, okay? That, that, that has to do with the thermal state. Um, and so here, if you do the math, then you, you rather than having uh, zero, one half and so on, you have uh, two and half that you can sum together, right? Because they're tensor product. And so you get a one here that, that gives you twice the first, the first gap. And that's actually, so the genesis matches, everything matches. So it's somehow uh, the fact that at the beginning of the evolution, the two interacting uh, things are in a tensor product. Mm -hmm. And now that you re-explain it, I also noticed that there was a T divided L on the horizontal axis. Yes. That would have been my next question because then I would have said with, with uh, Sides of the system, this should change the time after which this happens. Yeah, yes, exactly. At least, is, at least in a CFT where you have only one one speed, at least uh, then yeah. this this uh, T over L is enough to to kind of um, uh, uh, get rid of that uh, single velocity, right? So uh, that's why the more or less uh, the transition happens always at the same at the same point. Yes. Any further questions? Okay, then okay if that's not the case, then thanks again, Luca. And that also concludes the seminars for, for this semester. So we're gonna have a summer break.
thank you again for, for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, and we are going to have the school in September, right? So uh, yes. Do you want to say any any? Do you want to make any announcements regarding the school, Luca? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please come, come. Hopefully, <laughs> COVID will be. It's more like please send your students. I think that's the right message. Yes, yes. Send your students because uh, hopefully COVID will be in our past. You know, you know, best uh, scenario case. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like this as a closing word, so let me stop the recording.